Hello, this is Erica with Launching Legacies. Welcome to our daily devotional. If you uh, have been following us on Periscope, you'll know that this is a rebroadcast of uh, the devotional I, I literally did this morning. I'm rebroadcasting. I took the previous one down because I had made some errors. Um, actually, I got a little bit worked up about this subject, so I'm going to try to hold it together this time. But um, I made some errors that I felt like were really a, a problem, and so I wanted to rebroadcast broadcast so that I could correct the errors and hopefully keep us on the right track as far as the scriptures are concerned. Um, some things may not seem like a big deal to you, but other times we receive criticism because we've made small mistakes. And so um, my grandfather used to always quote the scripture, let not your good be evil spoken of. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand or misinterpret um, what I was saying in the previous devotional even though they were literally simple errors, um, I thought it better to rebroadcast. So here's the rebroadcast of applications from a sneezing child. Remember, we're in an extended devotional period, and we're looking at applications from biblical scriptures. So today we're looking at 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. We've been in this chapter before, but we're looking at Elisha and the miracle um, that is about to ensue of, with this child. So we can actually go back and look at the 15th verse, and what happens is in that verse, uh, Elisha is telling a woman that she's going to have a child. She's been barren, and so he tells her that she's going to have a child, and she's kind of like, you know, don't get my hopes up if this is not going to happen. I, you know, I have a problem with it. But she decides, no, I mean, but she decides to trust him. And, and indeed, she does have a child. And so when we get to the 18th chapter, the child is a little bit old. I mean, the 18th verse, excuse me. The child is a little bit older. And so it says, one day when her child was older... He went out to help his father and who was working in the har as with the harvesters, right? So he's working in the fields and suddenly the child cried out, my head hurts and my head hurts. And so when his head was hurting, they carried him home to his mother. Verse 19 and verse 20 said that, so the servant took him home and his mother held him on her lap, but around noontime, he died. Okay, so this child has now died and she carried him up and laid him on the bed uh, of the man of God. Okay, so there was a bed there for Elisha in her home and then shut the door and left him there. Now he's dead, laying on the bed and left him there. And so she sent a message to her husband, send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and have him come back to this house right now she's going back to elisha who has told her she's going to have this child although she was barren she's going to get help and so that she went on a donkey so it says uh verse 23 why go today he asked is neither a new moon festival nor a sabbath but she said it will be uh it will be all right and so on the 24th verse she said uh she saddled the donkey and said to the servant hurry and don't slow down until i tell you to okay so we don't really know if the man knows if the child is dead or not her husband we just know that the child is laying in elisha's bed and he is in fact dead but the wife doesn't say to her husband he's dead she just lays him in the bed and then she runs out on the donkey to go get elisha so that's an important part of this uh of this story and so i want to make sure that that was included on the 25th verse though she approaches mount carmel right where um where elisha was and he saw her in a distance and he could tell that the woman was troubled okay so he told his servant to run out and meet her and see if everything is okay with her with her with her husband with her child make sure everything is okay with her household so the woman um so the woman told Gehazi, who is Elisha's servant, okay, every, uh, he said, yes, the woman told Gehazi, is everything fine? So he's to ask the question, is everything okay, right? And so when she came to the man of God on the mountain, she fell on the ground before him and told her, and told, and Gehazi began to push her away. But the man of God said, which is Elijah said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is, okay? So he's, Gehazi's trying to kind of intercede, like what's going on? Why are you coming? Why are you running? What's happening? And the, and Elijah's knowing that the woman is trouble but she hasn't really responded and then she said to the to elisha she said did i ask you for a son my lord and didn't i say don't deceive me and get my hopes up right and so what she's saying is i asked you to give give me a son and i asked you not to get my hopes up now the son that i have has died right and so then elijah said to gehazi get ready to travel take my staff and go 
So he gives his staff to his servant. He says, don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. Okay. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives, you yourself and you yourself live. I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Okay. And Gehazi hurried on ahead and he put the staff on the child's face, but then nothing happened. Okay. And there was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him the child is still dead. And then when Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, his hands on the child's hands, and he stretched out on top of him. And the child's body began to grow warm again. But Elisha got up and walked back and forth across the room once and then stretched himself out again on the child. This time the, bo the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elijah summoned Gehazi, who was a servant, called the child's mother, he said. And when this she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. And she fell on her feet and bowed her down before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. And then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Okay, now we have all the accuracy that we need. Um, here, let's talk about the application of this story. It's a very interesting story here, right? This uh, woman was barren and Elijah tells her that she will have a child. Okay. She has the child. And then when she has the child, she's like, I told you not to disappoint me. When the child dies, she's like, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with the disappointment of losing this child that I've been praying for all this time. And so she is very adamant, even to the point that it looks from the scripture that she doesn't even tell her husband that the child is dead. She's just believing that this man told me I was going to have a child. I asked him not to disappoint me. Now my child is dead. I'm going back to the servant of God. I'm going to ask him to, to make my child well. Like you can bring my child back because you spoke life into my barren womb. And so my child, I need my child to live. Right. And so we have this big movement towards saving this child's life. And so the application is not even really literal as much as it is figurative. Here goes the thing. When we are working with children or when we have children in our lives, if they're our own children or if they're children that are part of our family or if they're just children that we know or children that we happen to interact with in some place, maybe some of you are teachers or maybe you, are, you work in a church or maybe you're just a neighbor to somebody's child. I really don't know, but most of us have a time in which we interact with children or young people at some point in our day or in our life. And so the application here is what Elisha does and what the mother's attitude toward this child's wellness is, and even the servant's obedience to Elisha is, is a desperate attempt to make sure that they're saving the life of this child. And so, like I said, although this is a literal example, like she, he literally saves his life by stretching out on him. I'm going to um, ask you to apply this in the theory of are we stretching out on the lives of the children who we touch, right? Are we putting ourselves in the vulnerable position to keep praying, to run and go get help, to, to, to search for a way to support them no matter what? Because God has given us children to steward, right? If we are adults and children are in our lives, they are there for our stewardship. He's calling us from our adult experiences to be there and to be accountable for these children, which means we can't be selfish, which means we can't be self-serving. We have to remember that our job, even if we're not biological parents, is to steward the, the lives of those children who are who are around us. And so it, it's not a point of, oh, I'm tired. Oh, that's not my child. Oh, uh, this is not important to me. Or, oh, it's not valuable. No, we need to remember that if a child is in our presence, or if a child is in our, our lives, that we have a call towards stewarding and being good to them, stretching out ourselves at times to be good to them, right? And so Elisha lays himself literally out on top of this boy, like you're going to have life. And it looks like maybe a modern, I mean, a, a old school version of, you know, CPR or treatment for hypothermia. I don't, really, I don't really know. In hypothermia, you put another person's body heat around you, right? So that you can warm up if, if that's all you have to warm the person up. But 
Also, he breathes into the, he puts his mouth on the boy's mouth and his eyes on the boy's eyes and his hands on the boy's hands. And basically he's meeting this child. The child is dead, but he's giving him life. And then he walks back and forth and does it again. He stretches himself out again. And so we see these people in a desperate attempt to give this child life. And I want to apply this to the lives of the children in our lives that, that we're connected to. Are we taking desperate measures to be there for a young person, to be there for a child, to be accountable for that child? Because like I said, we're stewards, but every person is not stewarding the life of the children that they have or the children that they influence correctly. Are we though? Are we taking this literal? God wants us to steward the lives of those who we are accountable to. And it's important. And, and, and it's a, a beautiful illustration because the mom says, look, go get the, the problem. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ride until I get there. Don't slow down. Don't stop. I don't care if I have to use the restroom. I don't care what has to happen. Get me to where this uh, prophet is because he's the one that said I should have a child and now that my child is here I want my child to live and it's a dedication it's a determination that happens she doesn't go and prepare her child for burial right she doesn't just say well it's a lost cause he just won't listen you know how disobedient these teenagers are he does she doesn't say all that she doesn't say oh well you know at least I got him for a little while that's what it is no she decides you know I'm going to have, he said that I was going to have a child when I wasn't thinking I was going to have a child. And so now I'm going to press for this child's life. This child's life is important and I want my child to be restored back to life. So let me go talk to this prophet and she won't even respond to his servant, right? The servant wants like, is everything okay? And it's like, almost like, she's like, I don't see anybody, but Elijah, <laughs> I don't see anybody, but the person who I know is going to stretch out themselves and make a difference in this situation. And true. And lo and behold, the servant puts the staff on the boy's face and the staff does not bring the child back to life he's like look it, it took this prophet to be dedicated to lay himself out to save this child's life and sometimes that's what it is right children make young people make bad decisions they're making life altering decisions as children as young people and they need us to steward them they need us to be there for them to support them as they go through the process we can't forget that right we can't forget our importance and our involvement in their lives and even as much as we can be there for them, we should be there for them. And so that's the application I'd like you to apply. Could you read 2 Kings, the fourth chapter on your own? There's a lot of miracles in this section, but if you just read the story of this woman and her child and this life and apply it to the people who you have an access to touch. I don't know if they're uh, nieces and nephews, grandchildren, children. I don't know who they are, but sometimes they require us to stretch ourselves out for them. That's what it is. Not to make them idols, not to make them more important than God or to make them, elevate them in some way that's, that's unnatural or unhuman. But we need to remember that we're stewards of their lives. And if we are stewards of their lives, how are we stewarding them? How are we helping them to come into a place of understanding and a place of wellness? We should be doing a good job in this. And so I want to encourage you, like I said, to pray. Not, not for launching legacies this time. I want you to spend this week in prayer, praying for young people, praying for children, praying that their lives would be lives that you would invest in, that you would steward in, and that you would pray that others would come to steward in their lives as well, because that's a part of being accountable. And that's what the character of God is asking us in this application of the story about faith, but also about what we'll do for the life of a child. Thank you so much for listening. We're praying for you. We're praying with you for young people. And we ask you to pray. And we'll see you again tomorrow with another of our devotional. Thank you for dealing with the repost of this devotional and uh, helping us to make sure that we're being accurate with the word so that no one is offended. But remember the lesson, which is even more important than anything else that we're doing, that good look at God is calling us to steward the lives of young people. Are you stewarding? Are you stretching yourself out? I hope so. We'll see you again tomorrow with another devotional. Until then, be blessed.